on Business Incorporated today. Nigeria's oil production down 195,000 barrels per day. European Union signs gas deal with Israel and Egypt. International Finance Corporation partners Guinea and Burkina Faso. Good afternoon. Welcome to the program. I'm Amy John McQuay. Let's go straight up into the markets in Africa. African continent kicked off the midweek trading session on a negative note at intraday. Nigeria's main index is still down from yesterday's close at 0.07%. At intraday, hanging on that 53,000 points level by just a threat. We do hope it still continues to hold on there. Meanwhile, South Africa's benchmark index is up almost a percent at intraday. Elsewhere, Egypt's index traded lower by 0.13 percent, while Nairobi Stock Exchange closed Tuesday negative 0.6 percent. Over in the Middle East, where sentiments were mixed, uh, the Abu Dhabi index fired up on higher in the green up. It was 0.39%, and Dubai climbed over 1%. Still within that region, Saudi Arabia's index dived 0.23% at intraday, while the Qatari index dropped by almost 1%, uh, that's 0.82%. Let's go to Europe now and have uh, Chris Kober joining us now to tell us how Germany has offered a 10 billion euro rescue package to former subsidiary of the Russian energy giant Gazprom, uh, where we do know that this is the section that is being owned and controlled by Germany. And of course, uh, uh, Russia had put its uh, stake off that uh, part of Gazprom for a while now. Well, uh, Chris, well, I guess this is expected, and uh, Germany now has a responsibility to run this part of Gazprom. The move is to prevent uh, Gazprom Germania from going bankrupt and to secure Germany's gas supplies, the government says. On April 1st, Gazprom ditched the energy trading, storage and transmission business following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And days later, Gazprom Germania was placed under state trusteeship by Berlin. Now, in mid-May, Russia imposed sanctions on Gazprom Germania and almost all of its subsidiaries, causing a financial imbalance in the company, according to the German government. Now, the loss of gas supplies due to the Russian sanctions and the need to procure replacement supplies at currently high market prices worsened the company's financial situation to such an extent that the German government had to secure its liquidity with a loan. With it, the government wanted to avert the insolvency of the company and prevent consequential effects in the market. The money is to secure liquidity and replacement supplies of gas. Now, the government is, is examining the possibility of converting the loan into equity capital in order to ensure security of supply in the long term. Now, this would mean that the state would take a stake in the company, which is now still called Gazprom Germania, but which is also to be renamed. Yeah, well, uh, the other part of Gazprom, the one controlled by Russia, is constraining the flow of gas to Europe uh, via an underwater pipeline through the Baltic Sea. And we know that this is even before uh, the, the end of the year when the uh, EU said they're going to, well, stop the flow or stop uh, the connection of gas between Russia and uh, and uh, it's Germany and some other. So uh, what's really behind this? Why is it coming earlier than expected? Gazprom is citing repair work on a gas compressor unit as the reason. Now, this work is overseen by German industrial company Siemens Energy, and there have been delays in returning this equipment. Siemens Energy says that the turbines were manufactured in Canada and needed to be regularly sent back for maintenance. One of the turbines was currently being overhauled in Montreal. And the company added that due to the sanctions imposed by Canada, it would currently be 
impossible for Siemens Energy to deliver overhauled gas turbines to customers in Russia. As a result, only 60% of previously planned daily volumes can be pumped through the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, which is Germany's main supply pipeline for Russian gas. And the announcement sparked concern in Berlin. After all, it comes at a time when Russia has cut gas deliveries to numerous European countries, namely Poland, Finland, Bulgaria, and the Netherlands, labeling them unfriendly countries as they've refused to pay for Russian gas and rubles. The transit of Russian gas through Ukraine has also been reduced significantly. And the announcement prompted the German government to also go ahead and offer financial aid to Gazprom Germania, as we discussed earlier. Yeah, well, uh, very suspicious at this time, Chris, very suspicious. Well, ahead of the U.S. Fed uh, announcement uh, where they're expected to hike interest rates, uh, how is the market, the financial market, how are they stationing themselves or preparing for that announcement? European stocks have been rallying uh, in early trading. The reason behind that is a surprise meeting of the European Central Bank. According to a spokesperson, the bank's rate-setting governing council would convene uh, to discuss the recent sell-off in government bonds, uh, mostly from South European countries. That, after East, the ECB said last week, it saw no need to create a new tool to help weaker economies cope with rising borrowing costs. Now, the ECB last week draw a line, drew a line uh, under years of ultra-loose monetary policy, bringing an end to its massive bond-buying stimulus program at the beginning of July, and it also flagged its first interest rate hike in over a decade uh, for the same month as Eurozone inflation is skyrocketing. Now, apart from the ECB meeting today, the Federal Reserve is on investors' minds as well, and the question whether the Fed will decide to increase rates by 50 or 75 basis points, along with the question of how much more likely a recession will be amid the Fed's increasingly aggressive stance towards inflation. So far, though, sentiment among German investors here is uh, upbeat, with the DAX gaining around seven-tenths of a percent in the early parts of today's trading session. All right, uh, Chris, thank you so much. Not very good times uh, in the world at this time. Uh, thank you so much. I'll we'll talk to you tomorrow. And uh, let's move to the UK now, where we have Juliana standing by. Juliana, good afternoon. Well, um, I do know that we'll get to the markets in, in a bit. But first, uh, the first two of payments that are supposed to help poorest households with the cost of living, which we've been talking about, is supposed to be from the 14th of July. But what's the criteria? How, how are these, the poor household, how are they being recognized? Well, what do you look out for? Good afternoon, um, Innie, from a very sunny, bright London. Well, yes, uh, finally, after much anticipation, the government have confirmed that 8.4 million people will be receiving £326 as part of uh, the first instalment of a £650 payment uh, for those who are struggling with the soaring cost of living crisis. The policy was first announced by Chancellor Rishi Shunak in the House of Commons last month after much concern was raised uh, by uh, charities and and the Labour opposition party about just how people were struggling. We had the huge um, rise in energy bills in April as well as a rise in national insurance. Ofgem, the energy regulator, have already confirmed that bills are set to rise for a second time um, in the autumn. And so this payment was needed. So uh, £326 will be paid to people who are on universal credit. This is uh, some sort of means-tested uh, benefit. Some workers will be able to get it because if you need uh, your wage topped up, then you will be eligible for universal credit as well as people who receive child tax credits too. The remaining £324 will be paid in autumn. The government had yet to release a date on when that payment will be made, but of course people will desperately need it. We have inflation currently um, in this country at a 40-year high of 9%. Tomorrow uh, the Bank of England are set to uh, rise interest rates, so it is coming at a time when it's needy, uh, but some charities and organisation groups are saying it just doesn't go far enough. Yeah, and uh, yet another disruption is expected uh, on the rail lines. What's this about again? Another strike?
It is another strike, but it's the same uh, strike that's been spoken about for the next, well, from the past uh, couple of weeks. Next week, 40,000 rail workers in uh, this country will be striking over three days um, on Tuesday uh, next week, Thursday next week, and on Saturday. This has been described as the biggest uh, rail strike in modern history. It is going to be ex um, uh, impacting hundreds of thousands of people because it happens to be taking place on times when uh, thousands of people will be out of the country using the rails to go to uh, a, a sporadic of different events. We're talking about the Grand National. There's also a, a festival called Glastonbury Any, I haven't been lucky enough to go there, uh, but I know tens of thousands of people are going to be heading towards that way. And now their traveling plans have been disrupted. Earlier today, we did hear a statement saying that apart from the three days where these strikes will take place, um, additional days uh, will be affected on the rails because, of course, if you're walking out for 24 hours, by the time you get back to the job, there are so many things to do. And this is going to disrupt passengers trying to travel on the following days. This is all about a long-running dispute over pay and working conditions. We know that uh, Transport for London and rail networks were heavily disrupted during the pandemic. Millions of people were told to work from home, and the British government had to top up uh, these rail networks so that they could survive. Now the British government are clawing back uh, that money, and by doing it, they are reducing staff levels and increasing working hours. Uh, union bosses are not happy with this, which is why they're walking out on the three days. And like I said, it has been described as the biggest rail walkout in modern history. And I'm sure it's something that we'll be talking about a lot next week, Ine. Yeah, so, so let's not uh, overflog that. Let's wait until next week, because I'm sure we'll be following and perhaps even get some pictures of how it's going uh, right there, Juliana. But how is the market at this time? Well, the markets are actually in tip-top shape, despite um, the concerns about a looming recession. We're still waiting to hear whether Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve will be hiking interest rates in the U.S., although that's pretty inevitable. But because there is a sense that interest rates will be hiked by Andrew Bailey and the rest of the Monetary Policy Committee tomorrow, banks um, are all higher because, of course, their profitability increases when interest rates are higher. So the banks is what's lifting the FTSE at intraday. The FTSE um, All Share, the FTSE 100, and the domestic market FTSE 250 are all trading higher by about 1%. But the British pound is trading lower against the US dollar, lower against the euro, and lower against the Japanese yen at intraday. All right, Juliana, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the bright, sunny day there, and then we'll talk to you tomorrow. All right, so let's move to Asia now. Uh, shares in China led gains in mixed Asia-Pacific trading uh, following the release of better-than-expected Chinese economic data. The Shanghai Composite in mainland China climbed 0.5% to close at 3,305.41, while the Shenzhen Components advanced 0.94% to 12,137.76. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index rose over 1% to close at 21,308.21. Uh, shares of Alibaba about jumped 4.35%. Elsewhere in Asia Pacific, the Nikkei 225 in Japan slipped 1.14% on the day, while the Topics Index dipped 1.2%. South Korea's Kospi fell 1.83%, and uh, S&P AX200 in Australia declined 1.27%, ending the day's trading at 6,601. MCSI's Brothers Index of Asia Pacific shares outside Japan sat less than 0.1% lower. In the United States now, stock features rose in early trading as investors anxiously waited for the Federal Reserve's in, in a decision. Features on the Dow Jones Industrial Average were up 90 points. S&P 500 features edged up 0.4% and Nasdaq 100 features jumped 0.5%. We have our correspondent in, uh, in the United States, Washington to be precise, Maria Bird, now to give us details of yesterday's trading. The U.S. stock market had another challenging day on Tuesday with very few gains. The S&P 500 was down by 0.37%, the Dow Jones down by 0.49%, and the Nasdaq was slightly up by 0.17%.
Many investors are concerned about the Federal Reserve meeting on Wednesday, as there is expectation that interest rates will increase by 75 base points. This could have a traumatic impact on the U.S. economy. But it is hopeful that it will decrease inflation, which is at a 40-year high. Many investors are skeptical that this will address the overarching economic issues in the U.S., but they do believe this will have a heavy impact on the U.S. stock market. Thank you so much, Maria. Let's take a break now. When we come back, we do have a lot of stories coming from the African continent here in Business Incorporated. To stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Business Incorporated here on Channel Television. Let's start from uh, the oil and gas space, natural gas prices plunged today at uh, Freeport. LNG said its facility had had a fire last week, likely won't be back up and running soon. Surging prices are adding to inflationary pressures across the economy. Drivers are already grappling with record prices at the pump, with national average for a gallon of gas topping $5, and now utility bills are also set to rise. Natural gas prices surged above $9, in May, hitting the highest level since August 2008. U.S. natural gas fell about 16% to $7.22 per million British thermal units. Well, uh, still within that space, Angola has become Africa's top oil producer, overtaking Nigeria in the month of May. OPEC's monthly report for May show that Nigeria's oil production reduced by 195,000 barrels per day to 1.02 million barrels in May, and it went from 1.22 million barrels in April, and that's based on direct communication. Records from OPEC monthly oil market reports, West Africa crude referentials also rose in May, supported by firm demand from European refiners and high middle distillate margins. European refiners also started to raise throughputs in April. Europe 16 refineries crude intake increased by 435 uh, trillion or 4.8 percent in April from March to standard 9.5. Four, six. Meanwhile, Asia-Pacific crude demand remained firm in May, and China's oil demand is expected to recover in the coming months on the back of easing COVID-19-related mobility restrictions. Israel, Egypt, and European Union have signed a trilateral natural gas deal in Cairo. That's Egypt as Europe scrambles to cobble together an energy strategy to replace the Russian supplies it has relied on for decades. The deal will enable Israel to streamline and increase the export of its natural gas through already existing pipelines to Egyptian ports, where it can be pressurized and liquefied and then transported to Europe. Israel in recent weeks promised to accelerate its gas output as demand grows and prices soar. It's looking in collaboration with other Middle East in Israel in recent weeks, promised to accelerate its gas output and demand outgrows price soars in collaboration with other Middle Eastern countries to sell Europe previously largest client of Russian energy. Let's go to South Africa now. Well, the country's mid-month data from Central Energy Fund points to further fuel price pain for motorists in the month of July from the price set to increase by as much as two rand and three cents per litre and one rand and 28 cents per litre for diesel. The latest data could see the petrol reach further all-time highs, reaching the 26 rand per litre mark. Motorists have had to grapple with sharply rising fuel prices since the beginning of the year, seeing fuel prices increase by 20% since January and over 40% year on year. The steep price increases forecast for July comes despite the government extending its fuel price interventions for a further two months. Meanwhile, Parliament is set to hold a debate on the ongoing fuel price increases. 
With the fuel price inflation causing such alarm in South Africa, the government and the central bank have been taking action to soften the impact on consumers. Well, we have an individual, Fazil Dal Dalmini. He proposes an alternative solution to that. Let's see what this alternative solution is. South Africa's delivery bike game may have just gotten an electric jolt with this three-wheel electric scooter. Dlamini is the founder and CEO of Green Scooter, which sells and leases these scooters and also provides a so-called last mile home delivery services to small businesses such as fast food outlets in Johannesburg's townships. The scooters, which resemble tuk-tuks, with a stylized design of curved lines, are manufactured locally with a Swedish firm acting as a technical partner. Lamini came up with the idea for Green Scooter after his job applications were rejected by Uber. Power is an issue. So it doesn't really directly affect me, but it does affect my sales. Because when people think they'll have uh, range anxiety, that, oh, what if I go to this place and there's no energy? So, I mean, um, you know when I built the business? I built the business in survival mode. And I always encourage it with all of my clients, is that always think in survival mode in the event that you may not have power in a particular day. Or look at an alternative. Some guys have purchased their own UPS, and you know, you're charging, a, 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 in this particular unit, it's a four kilowatt battery. In our latest unit size, it's a 5.1 kilowatt, kilowatt hour battery. People are literally now using those, and they're taking, they're taking power into their own hands, literally. Petrol and diesel prices have gone up by a third in South Africa in the past 12 months, and a forecast to accelerate further prompting the Treasury to extend cuts in fuel levies and the central bank to raise interest rates. The townships is a place for me that, that's, 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 that's close to home because when would the township ever have seen electric vehicles in, the, like in it, like actually operating, hey, where people can, can use the, the vehicles to generate an income and take more money back home because they don't have those fossil fuel um, troubles. Green Scooter has sold or leased 60 vehicles since it launched in 2018, and the pace has accelerated in recent months as fuel prices have soared. Lamini says his target was to reach 160 units by November. The scooters can be charged from ordinary electric sockets, which Lamini says makes them practical as well as an environmentally friendly alternative to the motorbikes commonly used by other last mile delivery operators. Let's look at um, the environment on, on, on its own. I mean, a lot of things that are happening in the world from a global warming perspective, it's not our fault. But if you can contribute towards fixing it, if you can contribute towards empowering and elevating your own society, then that's why I'm doing it. I mean, it's a socially impactful business. South Africa has struggled for several years with electricity shortages that sometimes result in load shedding or planned power cuts. Lamini said electric scooter users could overcome this challenge by using uninterrupted power supply units, devices that can store electricity when the power is on and for it to be used when it is off. For customers, it was exactly what they were looking for. I used it because of um, accessibility. It went to places like Soweto, you could order from Soweto, Alex, you know, those places like when in lockdown, it wasn't on Uber Eats and all of that. So it was very convenient. He said his advice to his clients was to always think in survival mode and plan ahead. I wonder how those scooters will look on the road of Nigeria, especially Lagos, with all of the demands on the road. Well, moving on to other issues now. The International Finance Corporation, the IFC, the investment arm of the World Bank, has partnered uh, Vista Bank to boost the trade finance capacity of West African lenders, Guinea and Burkina Faso's units. The agreement makes available trade facilities up to $24 million, $12 million for each of the subsidiary to finance imports of food, raw materials, refined oil products, equipment, and consumer goods. The IFC will also provide advisory services to strengthen Vista Bank's corporate governance and risk management capacities. It announced this on the sidelines of the Africa CEO Forum, which is ongoing in Ivory Coast.
Mineral exports from Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo through Uganda have been stalled after authorities closed the key transit border point of Bunagana following days of militia violence. The outposts, a transit route for minerals including tin and tantalum, a rare earth methyl used in the aerospace and electronics industry, has been a scene of heavy combat following renewed fighting between Congo's United Nations backed troops and the rebel known as M23. Uganda authorities have shuttered the border point, the latest setback for tin supplies from DRLC, which is Africa's number one producer of soldering metal. That's the program today. Thank you so much for being a part of this midweek edition. Let's do it again tomorrow. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Thank you.